Okay, so this is the second one, and this one is lipids, which is a, a term that includes triglycerides, phospholipids, and sterols. So I've, I've kind of pared this down. So this is another energy source, so we'll talk about energy uh, kind of items as well, topics. Um, and then we'll talk about how this affects the risk of cardiovascular disease, because this is kind of another example of where rubber meets the road as far as diet and, and cardiovascular disease risk. So uh, brief overview of what we're going to do. The basics of the structures, just so you understand, if, we, if someone says, eat an unsaturated fat or saturated fat or, you know, what cholesterol looks like. So we'll talk about that. A little bit about digestion and absorption and transport because as these fats are transported through the blood, that can affect risk of, of heart disease. Okay, so we'll start off with a little bit of terminology. I'm not sure why I have a cupcake there. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I should have a healthy fat there, shouldn't I? Uh, so when we talk about lipids or fats, we, that includes triglycerides, phospholipids, and sterols. And the most famous sterol for us is cholesterol. Now, when we say you know, eating dietary fat, for the most part, we're talking about these guys, triglycerides, because a triglyceride is a glycerol backbone, so it has a small molecule that the fat is actually attached to. So we'll look at the structure of that in a second. Uh, the fat, we call it fat because the fatty acids are the major part of it. Okay? So it has to do with kind of structural nomenclature or terms. Um, now those fatty acids have a variety of different structures. But we can kind of put them in different categories, like saturated, unsaturated, so we'll look at that. And then the last one is trans fatty acids. So we'll talk about uh, a really little bit about um, negative health effects of those, although I think they've gotten quite a bit of attention already. Um, so this is a fatty acid, the bottom. And the reason it's called a fatty acid is because it doesn't like water. It's fat soluble for the most part. Now this end of it over here is an acid group. That's what's called a carboxylic acid group. So when we put all these together, we say this is a fatty acid. Okay? It's not water soluble, it's fat soluble. Uh, so a saturated fat has the maximum possible number of hydrogen atoms. So in other words, every one of these carbons, all each of which will have four covalent bonds, every one of the, these carbons has a hydrogen wherever possible. So it's saturated with hydrogen. Okay? Now, one of the things, so it contains only a single bonds between the, car, uh, between the carbons, but most of the fatty acids of a food are saturated. It's called saturated fat. Even though a food might have some unsaturated fat, if most of it is saturated, we say, oh, well, it's a source of fat, saturated fats. Okay? Now, unsaturated fats lack hydrogens and have at least one double bond. So the double bond is considered the point of unsaturation. So we say it's an unsaturated fatty acid. If it has one double bond, it's what's called a monounsaturated fat. So we've probably all heard of those, the monos. Uh, they tend to be um, more healthy than saturated fat overall. And then we have polyunsaturated fats. They, have, they lack four or more hydrogens and have at least two or more double bonds. So we'll say they're polyunsaturated fatty acids. And we'll talk about that. One of the simple kind of telltale signs of whether or not a, a food item is mostly saturated or unsaturated is its physical characteristics at room temperature. So saturated fats tend to be solid at room temperature, whereas unsaturated fats tend to be liquid at room temperature. And it has to do with the structure of that double bond and how it changes the, the interaction between fatty acids. If there's a double bond, it tends to put kind of a bend in the molecule, and they can't stay as tightly close to each other. So they separate, and that makes it more of a, um, a liquid or oil at room temperature. Also, sometimes the length of the fatty acid causes that as well. So when we look at something like this, like olive oil, we say... Oh, it's an oil, so it must have a lot of unsaturated fat. And it does, but olive oil also has some saturated fat. So most fats are a combination. Now, you guys told me this earlier. I asked you if we do have to consume dietary fat, and we do have to consume some. 
And the two main reasons are shown here. There are some fatty acids that we need that we can't make. So they're considered essential in our diet. And those are linoleic acid and I have linolenic here. The better term is alpha linolenic acid. I probably should have caught that. But if you look at it, here's linoleic acid. How many double bonds does it have? It's got two. More than one, so we call it a polyunsaturated fatty acid. Okay? So both of the essential fatty acids for us are polyunsaturated fatty acids. They're long, unsaturated fatty acids. Okay? They do things on our body that saturated fats can't. And we can't take saturated fats and make these. So we have to have them in our diet. And that's, some of that's indicated here. Now, have you heard that omega-3 fatty acids and all that, right? So omega-3s get quite a bit of publicity. Linoleic acid, acid is actually an omega-6. And I'll tell you why that is in a second. But most of the linoleic acid we get is from vegetable oils and some in meats. Linolenic acid is an omega-3. We have to get it from food. It can make other saturated, sorry, unsaturated fats. One's called EPA, that's icosapentaenoic acid. Another one called DHA. Have any of you heard of that one? What's DHA? Where do you find that a lot of times? Infant formulas. Yeah, they'll add it in there. They'll say, oh, Similac or whatever. Some of those infant formulas, they'll say, plus DHA. And everybody goes, oh, that's great. Nobody knows what it's for, but... Uh, it's really important for development. So as infants develop, especially their brain and central nervous system and their eyes, DHA is really important for that. So that's why they add that in there. Um, and that's called docosahexaenoic acid as well. So it's important for anti-inflammation. These guys are development of the eyes, brain, and heart health. Even as we get older, it a lot, quite a few studies have indicated it might not be a bad idea to make sure we have significant amounts of EPA and DHA because as tissues change through time, these can have protective effects for that as well. Differences in structure here, here's saturated fatty acid, one of the most common ones in our diet is called stearic. Oleic acid is the most common monounsaturated fatty acid. So oleic acid is the most common monounsaturated fatty acid. Probably the most popular or well-known sources for oleic acid is olive oil. It's one of the benefits of olive oil and the Mediterranean diet and good sources of, of oleic because it has healthful effects. And then the linoleic acid is, is shown here. Okay. Now let's talk about omega-3 versus omega-6. Right, omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. So omega means the end. So over here, if we look at a fatty acid structure, this is a simplified uh, way of looking at it, here's the end of it. So here's what we call the omega carbon. So here's carbon number one, carbon number two, carbon number three. An omega-3 fatty acid has its first double bond between carbons three and four. That's why we call them omega-3s. We can't make that double bond. So what do we have to do? Eat it. And we get it from... Yeah, fish, fish oils, things like that. That's, that's a good source. Okay. Do fish make them? They should. They can. Vertebrates don't make omega-3s. Invertebrates. So what do fish do? They eat plants, accumulate it, and then what do we do? Eat fish. Take advantage of our location of the food chain, okay? So that's uh, omega-3s in general, we say, have certain health benefits. Omega-6 also required because we can't make that double bond either. Now, if we need to make a double bond farther away from that omega end, we can do that. We just don't have enzymes that'll do it at omega-6 or omega-3, so we got to get those from other sources, okay? In general, in the U.S., our diet is a lot higher in omega-6 than omega-3, and that can be a problem, okay? 
We, we would do better if we increase our omega-3 intake relative to omega-6. Have you ever heard anybody say, oh, the U.S. diet or the diet in the Western world is inflammatory? It is, and this is one of the main reasons. And inflammation does a lot of harmful effects it can, including increase our risk for heart disease. So some countries like Japan, they eat a lot of omega-3s. That protects them from um, heart disease, but they kind of make up for it in things like alcohol consumption and smoking. So kind of <laughs> kind of equals out in that way. Um, and probably yeah, a lot of other things. So um, and I mentioned, so we've been talking about fatty acids, but most of the fat in our diet comes from triglycerides. And here's the structure of a triglyceride. Here's glycerol. And it's got three fatty acids attached. So if you eat something like salmon, most of the fat in there is triglycerides. But some of the fatty acids that are part of this are omega-3s. So we consume the salmon, it has the triglycerides, and we can use the fatty acids that are part of the triglycerides. Okay? So we don't eat a lot of uh, fatty acids on their own. We, we can eat triglycerides. Um, so that's the major, when we say, you know, dietary fat, we're talking about triglycerides for the most part. That's 95% of it. So when we look at a, a panel like this, there's a few main points from this. Any place you see a red kind of bar in this graph represents saturated. Mono is, ah, here I go. Is that blue? Okay, mm -hmm. yes. blue. Uh, yes, sir, the last number. Uh, green is omega-6, and yellow is omega-3. So now look at this. Animal fats and the tropical oils, coconut and palm are mostly saturated. Look at that. Coconut oil, for example, almost all saturated. Palm oil almost are mostly saturated and lard, a lot of saturated. Now, if you look at these colors of all of this, which one tends to be in the lowest amount? The colors, the omega-3s. So in our typical diets, in the U.S. and Canada, it's hard to get enough omega-3s for us. So when we eat fat, a lot of it's omega-6. Omega-6 can be inflammatory. So that, that can be a problem. Uh, if we look down here, we have... Right, for example, canola oil gets a lot of good press. Oh, cook with canola oil. It's got omega-3s. Really? Not many. But it does have more than some of the other ones. Um, but if you look at olive oil, why is it so good? A lot of mono. It's probably 70-75% oleic acid, which is a healthy fatty acid. But one of the issues with these is those double bonds are not very stable. So in other words, if you heat them up, they'll break down. If they're exposed to oxygen, they break down. If you're exposed to light, they break down. So there's kind of benefits to using some of the more saturated fats for cooking and things like that. So especially years ago, they used to use a lot more of that. Uh, but now they're, they're a little bit more conscious of that. Down here at the bottom, um, we have some other options here. Any of you guys know anybody that takes flaxseed oil? Is any type of a supplement? Why do they take it? The oil might not, but flax would. Yeah, yeah flax seeds. Yep, yeah. yep. Put it in smoothies, things like that. Anything else? <laughs> Saw it on the internet. Yeah, <laughs> flax seed oil. Well, because like I've had like friends of mine. As you get older, you know, and you have more joint pain, they'll say, "Oh, I have to take flax seed oil. My my knee feels a lot better." How does that work? Reduces inflammation. Reduces inflammation. How? Omega-3s. Omega <laughs> okay. Here's the trick, though. The omega-3s that are in plant products, the main one is alpha-linolenic acid. In order for it to be anti-inflammatory, it needs to be converted to EPA. That is a slow, inefficient conversion. So you get a little bit of protection from that. A better, more potent source would be what? EDPA. And what's a good source of that? Fish. 
to one of the more significant ones. Okay. So in that case, those individuals might be There's better. Fish that you Oily fishes, gold standard it tends to be salmon, and if you eat salmon, it should be wild salmon, not farmed. Not farmed. There, there can be accumulation of certain things that aren't good. Yep. Mostly that. Completely. <laughs> little exercise helps, doesn't it? So just walk, you know, out in the ocean. Yep. Yeah. So that's that's one of the things. Now, what about fish oil supplements? Good idea, bad idea. It might be better than if you're not eating fish. Oh, help my dog. Helps your dog. <laughs> helps your dog. I had it recommended for me after I had surgery to help with inflammation. Yeah. Because yeah. it was my diet to help get back with inflammation. Yeah, it's anti inflammatory. They can be. Anything you want to be careful of? Over, uh, you want to be careful. So it's good you're working with your physician because physicians should be involved in that. Lots of people take fish oils. Hardly any of them are involved their physicians, and you really should. When we're talking anti-inflammatory, that's good, but you can overdo it. One of the things that our inflammatory system does is it's involved in our immune response. If you have too much of that, you can actually compromise your immune system. Another thing that inflammation is involved in is blood clotting. And obviously, there's sometimes we have to clot. It can be external physical trauma, or there can be damage within internal blood vessels that occur that we don't even know about that it has to clot. If we can't clot, we can internally hemorrhage and basically bleed out. Okay? So it's important that we don't take too many of them because we alter that ratio. So I would always say you want a physician involved with fish oil supplements. Okay? Another thing that you can do is compare the amount of those oils to actual fish because you're probably not going to eat fish every day but a lot of people take the fish oil supplements every day so you want to be conscious of relative amounts the American Heart Association does not recommend fish oil consumption unless a person has had a previous heart attack what do they say eat fish okay eat it twice a week good servings probably Three to six ounces, depending on body size, twice a week. That's the best way to do it because it's kind of hard to do it. And most people don't do that, but that's a very, very um, good habit to try and get into. Good. That's Yeah, that's good. And it's a good protein source. Great oils, good protein, all of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and if you... Um, so if you know anyone that does that, we want to make sure that they know not to take too much of that. Uh, so a little bit about trans fatty acids, right? Uh, they are probably a lower part of our diet than they have been. A lot of the food industry and, and the, the methods that they use to make certain products now have lower trans fatty acids. I think what a lot of people don't realize is they kind of started out as a way for companies to control food texture and products and also a way of saving them money because they're removing some of the unsaturated f double bonds. And that allows the fatty acids to be more stable. So you didn't have to refrigerate them, don't have to keep them in airtight containers, don't have to keep them away from light, and your food product is still stable. And then a few years later they went, oops, they're actually really bad. Okay, So now that's kind of changed. And, and trans fatty acids are in some natural products, animal products, probably more in dairy than anything because the bacteria in a ruminant's gut actually make some trans fatty acids and those trans fatty acids end up in the tissues and the milk so we get some naturally as well. Most people tend to get more of it from processed foods but it, we can get it naturally as well. I'm not going to go through this. Uh, the next one is sterols. For us the most famous sterol is cholesterol and um, sterols are found in plants and animal products. If they're in plants, there's a category called phytosterols. Plants don't have cholesterol. They have other types of sterols. Animals make cholesterol. Remember this one? So cholesterol is only in animal products, roasted turkey specifically. Meat, eggs, fish, poultry, and dairy products have it. Uh, 
Now, how much it affects your blood cholesterol depends on different people. So in general, we want to watch intake, especially in some populations that might uh, have more of an effect from dairy. Um, but we make a lot of cholesterol in our body. We make more than we consume in general. About two-thirds of all the cholesterol in our body, we made. About a third of it tends to come from our diet. And if you ever watch what I watch on television, if you ever watch a golf tournament, you see Lipitor, Crestor, all these lipid-lowering medication commercials, and then some other commercials I won't mention. Um, not cars, not investment companies, or some other meds that um, tend to be popular. Um, now, those drugs are really popular and can be effective because they target our liver's cholesterol synthesis, and they'll decrease it. And for some people, that can significantly decrease cholesterol levels. Now, there are side effects, so hopefully it's kind of a last resort to get on meds to, meds to control blood cholesterol, but um, if it's necessary, then and tons of people are on them. Here's cholesterol. One of the reasons we make it so we can make other things like vitamin D. All right, so we start with cholesterol, go in the sun, and then we can eventually get to vitamin D. We use it to make other things as well. Estradiol, testosterone, some of the other hormones. Okay? Now, again, a lot of detail. We're going to go minimal on this. Here's the problem. Fat is not water-soluble. Most places in our body, water-soluble. So it would be like taking a tube of water and adding oil to it and expecting that oil to go into solution. It doesn't. It coalesces, it floats, it sticks together. Take that water, shake it up, it'll revert right back to what it was. Unless you add something to it. For example, if I take this laundry detergent and I put it in that tube and I shake it up, now what happens? It disperses. It does what we call emulsifies. Our body makes our own detergents, and that's called bile. So when we eat fat, our body releases bile from the gallbladder. The bile is made in the liver, stored in the gallbladder. Now when I eat something and it goes through my stomach, my body starts prepping and releasing bile. So that when that fat is going through the small intestine, it's emulsified. It becomes water soluble. And that helps digestion and absorption. Okay? So as it's going through the small intestine, Enzymes are breaking up the triglycerides, the cholesterol, and some of the other types of lipids that we consume so that they can be absorbed. What if we lose our gallbladder? We don't lose it. We know where it went. What if our gallbladder is removed? That compromises that. So if a person, how many of you guys know anybody that's lost or had their gallbladder removed? Pretty common. A few people in my family. And uh, what do they do? Control fat intake, right? So you'll tend to reduce amounts, especially in one meal. The liver still makes the bile, but the gallbladder is not there to concentrate it. Not every species has a gallbladder. So an old trick is in the lab, in a, a research lab, is if you do an animal work and you get a new graduate student, you tell them that we're gonna, you would like them to excise the gallbladder from the rat. They don't have gallbladders. Mice do. So it depends on the species, depends on their diet. So we can do without it, but it helps. Here's what the problem if we don't have it. If we don't absorb that fat because it's not emulsified, it goes into the large intestine. If it goes into the large intestine, bacteria love it. They'll metabolize it, they'll generate products that water rushes in, and that creates a situation you can call fecal urgency. Um, <laughs> and, it can, and that can be a problem. Do that a couple times, and people realize I'm not going to eat that much fat at one time. Okay, so that's one of the the issues that 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 causes. But overall, our body typically has a way of digesting, absorbing a lot of fat. Now, it's the same thing though, when we take in that fat and it goes through the intestinal cells, then what are we going to do with it? Put it into the blood. What's the blood? Aqueous, or or a lot of lipids. Mostly water, mostly fats. Mostly water. So you can't take that fat and just put it into the blood. It would form fat droplets, 
it would not be beneficial. So what does our body do? Before that fat leaves an intestinal cell, it puts it into a special molecule called a chylomicron. And that's what this is shown. Chylomicrons are cousins to other molecules you guys have probably heard of. It's in this family called lipoproteins. So here are chylos. Here's some of the more famous ones. This one's not. But. See anything that looks like that? LDL. And HDL. You know what those stand for? Nice. Who named them that? The researchers that, that, that wanted to drive you nuts. The reason they're called this is because when you separate them in a research lab, you use density to do it. You use ultracentrifugation and density gradients to separate them, so they tagged them with these names. In general, right, we generally will say LDL tends to be bad, HDL tends to be good, and we'll talk about why. But chylomicrons are in this family. They're surrounded by molecules that can interact with water. On the inside of chylomicrons are whatever you just ate for fat. So if you just ate oleic acid as part of olive oil, it's in the chylomicron. If you ate dietary cholesterol, it's in the chylomicron. Chylomicron goes into the blood, it leaves the intestinal cell, goes into a structure called the, lymph, the lacteal that's part of the lymph system. Do you guys heard of that? Lymph nodes and all of that. It's another circulatory system that's not part of the cardiovascular system. So molecules can go through the lymph. Chylomicrons eventually get into the blood and they travel around the blood. That way, whatever you just ate goes to tissues. When you guys gave your blood samples, you fasted. One of the main reasons you fasted was let chylomicrons clear. If you didn't fast and I spun your blood and I looked at the yellow part of your blood, the serum or the plasma, it would be all cloudy. It would look like it's full of fat because the chylomicrons are still there. You wait about 10 hours, they clear. In other words, that fat you just ate is already in tissues. And now what's left? Mostly these guys. Now you measure cholesterol on both of these and compare the ratios of those. And these are the better health indicators. So we measure the cholesterol that's longer term in your blood rather than what you just ate. Okay. Went through these. Chylomicrons are made in intestinal cells. VLDL are made in the liver. And the reason they're important is because VLDL become LDL. And this is kind of the, this is the, the lipoprotein solar system for lipid nerds. Um, chylomicrons are huge compared to the other ones. And like you mentioned, HDL, they're high density. So they're a lot of protein, very few, very little fat. So they're dense and they're small. And then LDL are somewhere in between HDL and VLDL. Okay? So they're all slightly different sizes. And there's a lot of, we could talk about that for weeks, but here's kind of some of the take-home points for the health indications. Well, if a person has high LDL, what that means is they have a lot of cholesterol in their LDL. And that tends to increase the risk of heart attack. Now, it's not the only factor. It's one of them. So that's why we say, oh, that's a bad cholesterol. High HDL tends to be protective. This is because cholesterol in HDL is going to the liver for breakdown and excretion. HDL's picked it up from somewhere outside the liver and is taking the cholesterol to be removed from the body. So we say it's good cholesterol. Cholesterol is the same. It's just a matter, depends on which molecule it's part of. If it's part of LDL, it might become part of atherosclerosis. If it's part of HDL, it tends to be removed. Is HDL really protective? Who lives longer, men or women? Women. Guess one of the reasons. Women have higher what? HDL. I thought it was because the girl was crazy. 
that's one of the protective reasons is because HDL tends to be higher. Okay. This is a very brief overview of heart disease. And years ago, and I have some great articles on this. If you want more articles on this, like from Scientific American and stuff that has phenomenal graphics. Boy, they figured out atherosclerosis in probably the 1920s using a rabbit model. They realized when they fed them a lot of cholesterol, they could see that the, their coronary arteries were actually becoming closed. And when they did the initial studies, they thought, well, cholesterol is sticking to the inner part of the artery, and it's just kind of closing it off. The more advanced techniques made them realize it's not on the outside of it, it's actually in the arterial wall. So if you look at what's happening here, these cells in that interior wall have been injured. The immune system is responding to that injury. It's sending monocytes to that area. The monocytes convert to macrophage. The macrophage eat the LDL, and they hold it there. That happens over and over again until this starts building. Those tissues respond to that type of structure by moving smooth muscle cells over the top of it to try to close it off. So these smooth muscle cells migrate from below it to try to get on top of that. They form what's called a fibrous cap because they make proteins that allow the smooth muscle cells to stick together. So what happens? Propagation. Keeps going and going until one of two things can happen, or three things can happen. This can continue to go until this coronary artery occludes. And this can happen all over the body. It tends to happen more in the coronary arteries. It tends to be more detrimental when it's part of the arterial wall of the heart and the heart. It can go until this blocks off. Or what happens 85% of the time, this ruptures. This ruptures, and that causes a clot to form. That's called a thrombus. Platelets are attracted to the area. Platelets start sticking together. Now you have a clot. That clot can block this, and you have myocardial infarction. Basically, part of your heart is without blood flow. And you have a heart attack, essentially. Or it breaks off. <coughs> travels through the blood. Then what can happen? Stroke. Stroke. Pulmonary embolism. It can clot somewhere else. So a lot of the strokes start in coronary arteries. Now think, another thing that can happen is, if, you can, if a person can make whatever changes to stop this from happening, this can slow down. Change diet, change lifestyle, do all of these things. One of the things that potentiates this happening, those macrophage, look for altered LDL. One of the alterations, glucose stuck to it. So if blood glucose stays high for a long period of time, it causes this to be more rapid. It's one of the reasons we watch blood glucose. What does this depend on? A clot. What can you consume that will decrease the likelihood of a clot? Aspirin? Omega-3s. Omega-3s. Decrease clot formation. Protective. And omega-3s decrease LDL cholesterol. So they decrease the amount and the <coughs> clotting. So they're very, they tend to be protective for those reasons. Okay. Now, there's some medications that will actually reduce that. Like the statins, they can sometimes reduce that lipid core. So if a person's had a myocardial event already, probably not a bad idea they're on statins. If they haven't, maybe not a good idea that they're on statins. Okay. So what are some of the other things we can do? Factors that lower LDL and may, may raise HDL. Weight control. And one of the reasons that weight is important is because, in general, the more body fat a person has, the more likely their muscles are going to become resistant to insulin. Because there's crosstalk between tissues. And fat cells can actually make muscle cells insensitive to insulin. So what happens? Blood glucose stays high and all that tends to happen. So, we want to, so that's one of the reasons we watch weight specifically. And a lot of people don't have access to DEXAs. So they look at the scale and we just assume if they're losing weight, they're probably losing body fat. You can replace saturated fat with monos. That can help. And polys. Soluble fibers can help. 
So fiber intake helps. Phytochemicals, where are those? What's phyto mean? Close. Plants. Plant products tend to have some molecules that help. Moderate, I should probably underline this, especially for college students. Moderate, uh, excessive, alcohol consumption. You've heard that, right? Glass of wine, stuff like that. The ethanol can actually help. Too much of it, obviously, is not good. Uh, physical activity. And I would say probably, you know, all different types of physical activity, including high intensity. And, of course, as most things, genetics are a factor in this. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this one. Actually, I won't. Let me go through this real quick. This is a fat cell, also known as an adipose cell. Fat cells are made to store fat. Okay? So what happens is fat cells can shrink in size. As we add more body fat, the same fat cell can expand so that 80 or 90% of its volume, triglyceride. Now, as we lose weight and we lose body fat, what happens? goes down. That fat cell will tend to stick around. What's it waiting for? Be able to store fat again. But if you keep it at a minimal size for a relatively long period of time, eventually the fat cell will go away. Okay? There are certain times in life where we tend to make more fat cells than others. During pregnancy, during adolescence, during certain times when we're kids, we tend to make significant amounts of fat cells. If... We're consuming more calories than we actually are expending. If a, if a young person accumulates a lot of fat cells, that can make it hard for them to control body weight for the rest of their life. Okay? And you've heard people say, man, I, I walk by a donut shop, I gain two pounds. For some people, it's kind of, that's kind of what they're up against. They can store fat, significant amounts of fat, relatively easily. So what we can do is... Keep them on basically on a program where they're eating less than they're actually than they than they're burning. So physical activity, watch calorie intake. These will shrink and eventually can go away, and then it becomes easier for them. But again, that's one of the, the nice things about Dex is we can actually track that amount of body fat and see what's going on there. Okay. So again, those are um, cells, and they're they're all over. That for women, they tend to be in certain places. For men, they tend, they tend to be in certain other places. But um, that gives us the ability to store a lot of energy. Okay. Um, we can store fat as fat. And it says has twice the energy as fat. How many calories does each gram of dietary fat have? How about carbohydrate? How about this one? <laughs> Any calories in there? Seven. Seven. <laughs> Can we convert this to fat? What is that? Yes. That, that's alcohol. Oh, Ethanol. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Very easily. Easier than any of the other than protein or carbohydrates. And the reason is, when we consume ethanol, our liver targets the ethanol. And our liver prioritizes ethanol metabolism. So it'll, it'll take that ethanol and it'll make it to molecules that they're, it's trying to get rid of it. While it's doing that, some of those molecules actually become fatty acids and we store it as body fat. It also changes our metabolism on our liver. So it'll take priority away from basically assimilating and processing nutrients. So it can significantly affect our um, nutrient metabolism as well. Um, I won't go through all these. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about hormone-sensitive lipase tomorrow when we talk about exercise. And this is, this is, the body can store unlimited amounts of fat when fat is consumed in excess. Basically, that's one thing that we can do, uh, store a lot of fat. <laughs> Great. Uh, can also convert, I went through this, fat needs carbohydrate to break down efficiently. There's another reason to consume carbohydrate. I'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow. It helps us burn fat. Carbohydrate helps burn fat. There's an old saying in nutrition that says, 
Fat burns at a carbohydrate fire. Carbohydrate helps burn fat. A lot of people don't realize that, but that's another reason we have, we'll have adequate amounts of carbohydrate in your diets. Uh, went through this. We do need triglycerides for a few different reasons. You guys are going to, uh, you'll have blood values, and, and that way you'll have these as well. You can look at those. Uh, but the blood lipid profile, that's what you did. If we look at total cholesterol, we want it to be less than 200. LDL, less than 100. HDL, we want it to be higher, and triglycerides, we want it to be lower. Triglycerides can sometimes indicate insulin sensitivity. So if a person has high triglycerides, that can be an indicator that um, insulin might not be working effectively. And I mentioned these, risk factors for heart disease, high LDL, high blood pressure is another one that we want to watch, and smoking. Those are the three main risk factors for heart disease, in addition to... Um, genetics and some other things as well. So what do we want to do? We want to try to make sure we consume adequate amounts of mono and polyunsaturated fats because they decrease risk. Good food sources are here, olive, canola, peanut oil. Vegetable sources of polys are here. Benefits of omega-3s, I went through those pretty much. We talked about fish and mercury a little bit. And the last one, the DRI. So the guidelines recommend fat intake between 20 to 35% of energy intake. We're going to put you guys at about 25%. That'll help you control appetite. It gives us some healthy fat so we can get benefits without putting, I don't really think low fat diets are a good idea for quite a few reasons. Okay. Um, and we're going to put you an equal balance of saturated mono poly to get the benefits from each of those. Any questions? Okay, guys, thank you. We'll, we'll stop there, and then we'll do protein. Protein after this, right?